suddenly the idea of producing the record live on Twitch became really appealing because it was a way to produce the songs where I would be in community with people. My mind wouldn't be sort of in like alone in a void with that subject matter, if that makes sense. Welcome to Audio Technology Magazine's ISO Booth Podcast, where we phone audio engineers and producers at home. And thanks to the pandemic lockdown, they answer. Hey everyone, it's Chris here from Audio Technology Magazine again, and um, I'm uh, here for another ISO Booth podcast. Um, I'm here uh, with Becky Witten. Um, Becky is the definition of the modern audio professional. Um, by choice and by necessity, Becky has many creative balls in the air. Um, she's uh, soon to release a new solo self-produced album under the moniker Afia. Uh, professionally, she's mostly camped at the Avacan studio at the Rolling Stock recording rooms in Collingwood, and she's freelancing from a home studio as well. Um, Becky has been heavily involved with the annual Girls Rocks Canberra music program as a sound manager as well. So welcome, Becky, to Audio Technologies ISO booth. Thanks, Chris. It's nice to be here. Thanks for having me. That's a pleasure. So um, just tell me for a start a little bit about uh, your journey um, and... Um, uh sort of give us give us your potted history for a second potted history well i started making music and also getting into production and mixing through my solo choral work so i started out recording layers and layers of vocals into um garage band for ipad um and i would place my iPad on top of a series of stacked biscuit tins and books. And then I had like a homemade pop filter that I made from a coat hanger and a stocking. And I would hold it in front of the iPad's little condenser mic and I would just sing. I think they had like six tracks or eight tracks um, on GarageBand for iPad. And I would try and cram as many layers of vocals as possible into that. Um, and eventually I got frustrated with the limitations and so I upgraded to Ableton and upgraded to uh, using like a dynamic mic and um, and from there I guess I just started to because I was mixing all my own stuff and I started to feel a bit frustrated that the mixes weren't as good as I knew that the music a lot of the music I was listening to could sound and um, so from there I chose to sort of study mix engineering and that took me on this whole journey of uh, interning for another mix engineer Andre Ehrman and then from there I learned the trade um, learned about mastering as well because he worked out of a mastering studio called Deluxe in Melbourne and um, and then I was able to use all those skills for my own project um, and also for other people's work which was really exciting to be able to branch out into. Mm, for sure so I guess um, tell me a bit about what you're mainly uh, doing I guess prior to uh, the shutdown where uh, that's a different chapter in everybody's lives but like <laughs> um, truly <laughs> what were you uh, what were you mainly doing up until the shutdown well so I I guess it's it's interesting because um, out of rolling stock I was doing a lot of vocal production um, for a really wide variety of artists like from pop to to kind of like really stripped back solo singer songwriter vibes um right up to like hip-hop styles so um it was it's been a big change because obviously in the pandemic sort of situation uh vocal production isn't such a great idea in an attended setting um because you know singing it's one of those breath aerosolization situations <laughs> Um, but, um, and, and also just like a lot of studi studios are shutting down, of course, um, or like temporarily closing, we hope. <laughs> um, yeah, but, um, so before then, before that whole situation, I was obviously working in that way a lot, but, um, now I have been doing heaps more mixing and heaps more mastering, um, 
and it's been good I think to just have that sort of change um, but also to connect with uh, vocal production in a different kind of way I've been doing a lot of live streaming around like how people can record vocals at home and what strategies people can use to maybe even work with a vocal producer remotely hmm, okay tell me tell me about that because I, I I was um, noted with interest um, the idea of you um, doing live streams of twitch streams of of um, yeah basically I guess doing tutorial streams um, how's that going and like what what does that look like it's um it's been an interesting journey with that too actually um, because I I started out doing live streams because uh, my old boss Andre uh, he was a Twitch streamer and he was streaming like lots of mixes and basically the vibe would be like he would go on Twitch and the artist he was mixing for would be in the chat just like giving him feedback and maybe the artist's friends would be in the chat too, just being like, hey, like that reverb sounds cool or whatever. And um, he kept telling me, you should do it, you should do it. And I was like, oh, I don't know, I'm shy. <laughs> like, um, and then uh, I started out, like when the pandemic first started, I was feeling a bit, I guess, disconnected from people and, you know, you just – you want to kind of go out and see friends and you can't. And I was like, okay, well, maybe I can start doing some live streams just on Instagram. And I did um, just a bunch of kind of tutorial live streams. Like people sent in questions about vocal production, about like mixing, about what I'm using Ableton for and all that kind of stuff. And I would just like answer them in the form of a pretty informal chat a pretty informal chat just over live stream and um and you know people would kind of riff off that i guess a bit like people had other questions that arose from what the original subject matter was and all that kind of thing yeah. um and then i had written this is going to sound really funny and probably a bit daggy but i'd written this album like i'd written all the lyrics for this album that's coming out shortly um in a in sort of like the the like tipping point i suppose of the pandemic here in australia like i wrote a lot of stuff right before all the lockdown um like regulations came into place and i was feeling very uncertain and scared but detached from that uncertainty and fear in a way that allowed me to kind of write i guess poetry about the feeling without uh, fully acknowledging its present reality, I guess. And so I wrote all these lyrics and I felt um, confident about them at the time. Like I was very, um, you know, these lyrics are good, these lyrics are worth mm. turning into songs. But then I, once once everything kind of set in, the reality set in, um, I found myself almost scared to go back and produce them, um, which is a strange thing, I guess, to talk about. Um, I feel maybe a little embarrassed about it, but it's a scary time, I suppose. Sure. And, um, and so suddenly the idea of producing the record live on Twitch became really appealing because it was a way to produce the songs where I would be in community with people, my mind wouldn't be sort of in like alone in a void with that subject yeah. matter, if yeah. that makes sense. No, I, mean, I, I understand. I hear what you're saying. I can see why it would kind of take some of the pressure away from the process. Yeah. I mean, to some extent, I feel like maybe if I'd done it without live streaming it, I would have been fine. Like I, I think that the process is always absorbing in a way that takes your mind off the direct subject matter of any songs that you've written but doing it on twitch added this extra layer where i would have to i guess be conscious of where i was at on any given day because of course you know you're 
you're presenting publicly. Um, anyone can come and watch those streams. You don't necessarily have to be a Twitch user even. And so I would have to kind of collect myself a little bit and put myself in that same state that I think I'm in when I'm producing vocals in attended sessions in the studio um, because, you know, you're hosting people, you're creating an environment for other people to step into. Um not only sonically, but, you know, with your hospitality and with your personality. So, yeah, there's an yeah. accountability there, I guess. Totally, is, totally. Yeah. But, but mm. as opposed to those attended sessions, is there a randomness or, you know, just a danger is a strong word, but like a heightened <laughs> sense, like just like a, it's, it's riskier, I guess, is the word. Yeah, I have often thought that um, now is the right time for me to be doing this kind of thing. Like I think that, you know, in the early years of my career, it might have been embarrassing or I might not have felt um, confident enough to sort of talk about my practice in the way that I now can. Um, and also like learning how to communicate the ideas um, behind your production and behind your mixing practice. That's a skill apart from doing the stuff itself. Mm. So, yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah it's tricky. So what do people, how do they interact? Do they interact? Um, well, <laughs> Twitch is a really interesting one because, uh, I mean, I have a lot of people who have kind of carried over from uh, just following me on Instagram, following my music or following my engineering on other platforms of social media as well. And so they're all these kind of like very lovely, chill people who are just kind of sure. there for music. Yeah, exactly. But then like Twitch is a funny platform in that it started out as this gaming platform, like people would just live stream their video games. And um, the culture around that is kind of, uh, I guess it's like a bit um, like teasing. Like people love to neg each other and just like, you know, they laugh at your failings. <laughs> so um, there are definitely like random people who come through and like just love it if I like, you know, have a really whack vocal take or something like that. And they're just like, <laughs> lol, sending me a billion like ridiculous emotes. Um, but I think that's fun too. Like I like that it's an accepting platform for when you do something wrong or like when you like, you know, just are a human being basically. Um, because a big part of like even from the very first days of making music, I've always had this, I guess, ideology of like it's important for people to see your growth and to see that you can improve over time as an artist as a producer, mix engineer, whatever, because I only was able to do the stuff that I have been doing because I saw other um, women in production uh, doing kind of rougher stuff to start off with. Like I'm thinking specifically of like, um, I don't know if you've ever listened to Grimes's early records, um, but her first record is just like clipped is like hard clipped all over the place um and you know there's like out of time loops and all kinds of stuff um but it still has a real vibe like you can tell she had a vision and i think that it's important for people to see that like if you have a vision then you can develop it into something more polished yeah yeah that's interesting um and i guess with uh you know your you know your your specialty as it were of uh, vocal production um uh what are your main tips for people in a pandemic to uh, uh, be able to achieve something that they're happier with um i think there's a bunch of technical tips that i can give but i think the biggest thing for me in terms of like making a breakthrough with producing my own vocals at home is to sort of try and create the emotional space that a vocal producer would in a studio. So a big part of my job, it's, it's not just picking the preamps, it's not just picking the mics, it's not just sort of getting the gain staging really tasty. It's making sure that a singer feels comfortable and then scrutinising 
not only what is maybe sounding not quite right in a vocal take, but listening out for what sounds really great and encouraging the vocalist to lean into their strengths even more. Um, and I think, you know, it, it can be tricky to do for yourself at home um, because, you know, often you're kind of trying to cram the two roles of performer and producer into a tight space. But one thing I've been saying to a lot of people is, you know, if you have the time, like if you maybe are on JobKeeper or if, you know, you just have that extra bit of free time on your hands, give yourself a day to be a performer and then give yourself, you know, a full night's rest, maybe two, and then come back and be a producer on a different day and have that clean slate, you know. I think it helps a lot. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, I'm not a singer, but uh, I was... Uh, thought to myself that if I was that um, half the battle is um, being able to, as you say, to spend those hours um, with a mic and headphones and finding your voice. Like it must be pretty scary. If you, even you must have found, um, even with you know relatively experienced performers, that when they get into a formal setting, that it's confronting often. Um, do you know what I mean? Oh, totally. I mean, I think that's a big part of why my job does involve so much of that sort of um, emotional space creating. <laughs> it's uh, it's really tricky to overcome your hang-ups about your voice or maybe like the unfamiliarity of a setting and just sink fully into what the song is trying to convey. And that's that's the aim as a performer and as a vocal producer is to like sync up the performance with the emotional thrust of the song. Mm. So what are some of the techniques? Like there's um, candles, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> but, uh, um, what, are, what are some of the things you've done over, over your time? Producing. Well, <laughs> I honestly, I haven't busted out the candles. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think like it really depends on the singer. Like some people honestly feel more comfortable if you are quite blunt. Like some people don't really want you to use any flowery metaphors to sure. talk about the way they perform or anything like that. They just want to be told if they're singing flat and that's that's that. Um, but, I mean, humour goes a long way. Just being able to, like, you know, reflect on a funny lyric or, like, or even reflect on, like, not necessarily, I guess, um, like just humorous moments, but to understand what's going on in the lyrics and to make a comment on how the vocals are kind of matching up with what those lyrics are saying. I think that's really important. Um, and I guess just um, meeting each singer where they're at. Uh, like some people, some people are the uh, contrast to that blunt approach you know some people really want to hear um like like there's that classic joke of like you know a producer sits at the back of the room and they just tell you to make it more purple or whatever <laughs> um and I think that obviously like that is quite funny um but like there are some people who just really need to be told to make stuff more purple you know <laughs> <That's true. laughs> um <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah. it's 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 uh, really uh, sticking a empath slash psychologist hat on, um, figuring out <laughs> what works, uh, and quickly figuring out what doesn't. I suppose. Well, yeah, totally. Like, I think it's important to be able to read if someone's feeling uncomfortable. I mean, like, you know, sometimes it's easy for me to slip into um, hypercritical mode and be thinking, oh, you know, that belt isn't working in that point or whatever. But you know, if a singer is feeling uncomfortable about receiving a lot of critique, sometimes it's best just to, like, back off and let them do a few takes and just, like, experiment. Because I think often, more often than not, when critique is making a singer feel uncomfortable, it's because they haven't quite nailed down their vision for what a song is going to sound like. And a, a big job of a vocal producer is just to make the space for an artist to find 
their vision because they're always going to have like they've they've written a song and they know in their heads somewhere what it's going to be like but sometimes it just takes a bit of like running through it and getting comfortable with it to kind of sink into that um so yeah so a big part of my role is just not to pressure that to just help it happen however it needs to and at whatever pace it needs to um you strike me as somebody who um isn't a superficial thinker um so have you (laughs) have you considered i guess when you're talking to people about um being the performer and sinking into that sort of right wing um right brained um state and then spending a day in your left brain state and sort of separating those kind of tasks like um have you reflected on how you sort of pathologically have been able to um combine the creativity with the mechanics and um and what that what that means for like a modern day producer and how um how often that's kind of expected these days with people producing their own uh, music more and more, excuse me. Um, Is it unfair to ask, you know, somebody who's, you know, creative and wants to release their vision on the world to then be able to be like some kind of hypercritical (laughs) uh, sort of engineer, um, you know, the following day? I love this question. This is actually such a great question. Um, I think that, uh, I don't think unfair is the word. I think it's just different people have different strengths. Um, Like I was thinking about this recently because I wrote an article for Pile Rats about a bunch of artists who are both uh, producing and mixing their own work. And when you think about it, you know, there's a bunch of artists who fill those roles in addition to their artistic role, but then any number of other artists have other adjacent strengths that are also, you know, something apart from music. Like it might be artists who direct their own video clips. It might be um, artists who are running a, a big production team, like basically being charismatic leaders and you know directing management and directing visual collaborators and to do to create something really beautiful in a way that you know showcases a whole different skill set um and so I think it's just about like I think that it's not um something that artists are necessarily pressured to do um because there is that option of you know working with an outside vocal producer or working with basically working with anyone outside of yourself who is able to supplement what you don't have as an a strength in addition to your music um but I do think that it can be a really interesting sort of um side strength to navigate when you're being your own vocal producer or being your own any kind of producer really um i think the thing that i have encountered that is kind of most relevant to this with my own vocal production is just the the time it's taken me to find the balance between you know being creative enough being emotionally engaged enough with my own material and my own kind of lyrics um while still being critical enough um cuz i i do think th- uh it's i think that maybe initially m- my my kind of leaning was to perhaps be a little bit too emotional with my approach, like um, I would have this kind of rigor when I was producing vocals for other artists and getting them to do a bunch of different takes and, you know, being quite um, being quite picky, I suppose, about what tiny inflections were feeding in to the overall power of the performance. Um, but when I came to my own stuff, I was like, oh, I guess I will have just absorbed all that and I don't need to kind of take the same time and take the same approach. But once I did start taking that same approach, I think that is actually weirdly what propelled me to 
become the kind of person who can do a vocal in one take because I, I like I went through that process of doing all the takes and I went through the process of kind of scrutinizing the tuning and scrutinizing the the kind of minutiae of how my voice was conveying the emotion and now it just comes more naturally I think it's actually honestly true of a lot of vocalists that I have worked with it's like you know they take the stuff that I suggest to them in session and apply it if they do you know get into a situation where you know like often these days like you know um, you're at home probably not able to go out to a studio and so they can use those techniques and just apply them as they record at home yeah good um just a question about audio as a as a career um uh, you came through like the SAE system and did a degree in sound um do you look back at that as being um like the you know a really good pathway i think it was necessary for me just because i i mean i had i've talked about this um in a few interviews just like how people will say to you um you know, just, you don't need to study audio, just Google it. Um, but the thing is, unless you come from that sort of community that's already talking in audio terms, you don't necessarily know what to even Google. So I, and I had no idea. So I appreciated just being given a vocabulary that I could then take into the broader music industry and that I could use to ask more pertinent questions about how to improve at what I do. And how did you uh, develop a an awareness of what it would take to have a career, and how would you have to piece it together almost? Uh, I think my boss um, for my first internship and for my first audio job was pretty crucial to me figuring that stuff out because Andre he um, also runs his own business and he has had to go through like every trial of setting that up like you know working out how to do admin working out how to get all your behind the scenes tax stuff down like all the nitty-gritty that you maybe don't think about when you think of you know a glamorous Rock audio roll, career yeah, yeah. <laughs> um so yeah so that was i mean just learning from him uh, and i guess having other people who aren't necessarily in audio but also run small businesses was helpful having friends to talk to about that yeah um it is uh turned into a your classic um small business operation now isn't it because the um, kind of the the more corporate side of of sound um, and recording has you know, largely disappeared. So um, you know, to be successful, you need to be extremely motivated, uh, small business operator. Really, would you? Agree? Yeah, yeah. Um, I actually did. Uh, the NICE program. Do you know about the NICE program? It's a new enterprise incentive scheme. I think it's what it stands for. I'm aware of it, yeah. You have to sort of build a case for um, almost like business sort of planning. Um, uh, but, yeah, go on. You, you explain it. Yeah, yeah. Basically, so um, it's uh, for uh, people who are on sort of uh, job seeker. And uh, when I first moved to Melbourne, I was in that position and um, I like really, I didn't really know what I was doing when I first moved to Melbourne from Canberra. It was um, a very like terrifying big city move. And so I, and I'd been working as a singing teacher in Canberra. And so I, um, a friend recommended doing this course to me. And so I did it and it was, it's just a short course that uh, gives you all the skills or, or the basics, I guess, to, um, running uh, and maintaining a small business uh, and so I think just having that behind me as well was useful um, and yeah and just gave me I guess like a the, the vision so when I went in to study audio I was already I guess thinking in terms of how a small business would be run so I think that was helpful yeah 
Um, See, so you've uh, been uh, integral or you've... Um, the, the Girls Rock Canberra program has been something big on your radar over many years. Um, uh, I guess before you tell me about that, um, I guess that gives me permission to ask you about <laughs> being a woman in audio. Oh, uh, please. <laughs> yeah. Uh, because clearly you, um, it's, it's something you're passionate about and m mentoring other younger women. Um, what's your take? So I think, <laughs> well, what's your take is, is very broad. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, so first of all, Girls Rock Camp, uh, has been really great. I think for Australia, mm. it's been cool to see it grow from Canberra to, I think it's in almost every state now. Um, and I think it represents like a network around the country of um, women, but also gender minorities more broadly. Um, it's it's not strictly for women, it's for non-binary people and it's for trans men. Um, and it's been great just to see how it has given a start to a lot of artists and a lot of industry people um, who maybe would have had a more obscured pathway if it weren't for having that mentoring. Um, and, like, it's cool, like, because, you know, you go into programs like that and you kind of know abstractly that it's a good thing, um, but, you know, you don't necessarily – I mean, maybe this is, like, too cynical of me, but, you know, I, I, I didn't go in expecting that I would see, like, campers that I had worked with, like, go into these industry roles – during my lifetime maybe or like maybe that you know I would not have the access to kind of watch their careers unfold mm. um but I really have seen that we've mm. seen that around the country um so I think that's really exciting um but I still like it is tricky because I do feel that the industry does still have this um like you know, white dudes vibe to it uh, that is tricky to escape. But I think it's, I think here in Australia, a lot of it's about um, creating more niche communities. Um, that's what I'm excited about. Just people starting up labels, people starting up, you know, like, like groups that are going to be playing live shows online or, or live again, hopefully. <laughs> um, and finding the power in that, in that community approach, sure. um, yeah. Yeah, and it's never been a better time technologically to be able to achieve that, really. It's not really any kind of technological or marketing um, obstacles so much. Yeah, I feel like there is a certain, like, people are more accepting of artists who are coming up through maybe different platforms outside of labels that are more established. Um, like I've definitely seen more excitement around that um, during this pandemic era. I'm not sure mm. why exactly that mm. happens, um, but, you know. People have time to dig, I guess. Um, but, yeah, uh, yeah, maybe that's it. it uh, connecting audiences with, um, with performers, um, like it feels like it's as easy as it's ever been. Like clearly, you know, 20 years ago it was impossible. You, you, you might have to go to some obscure festival, you know, in Denmark <laughs> and spend, mm -hmm. you know, $10,000 for the privilege of seeing somebody you'd heard about. And now you can obviously just uh, click uh, in your browser and you're there. But, um, mm. yeah, yeah, no, that, that, that's good. So it's, yeah, there's a power in sort of bypassing the machine. Yeah. Totally. I mean, something that always has made me feel um, a little sad in my career has been, you know, when artists feel like, you know, I obviously get a lot of emails from artists in a range of different stages in their career. And it's always made me feel a bit sad when artists who are kind of maybe not 
supported by labels or supported by management teams when they talk about their art in a way that is sort of downplaying it because they don't feel supported in that way because it's like, you know, you've made something beautiful and that stands apart from whatever else, you know, whatever whatever scaffolding could be around it administratively, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, look, this isn't to push back at what you're saying but just to sort of explore it. Um, music industry's never been fair. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, capitalism's not fair. <laughs> yeah, this is true. I, uh, it's, it's a – but, well, uh, yeah, I guess – it's is there a distinction between music as a career versus music as um as uh like a not therapy but you know um what's the saying you know um talent does what it can and genius does what it must uh you know for some people who have the song and the art in them they have to get it out and um and sometimes it's gobsmackingly amazing and sometimes no one wants to listen to it. But, um, you know, it, they, it's still great to be able to have mechanisms to support people who, um, to any aspiring artist who wants to, you know, sacrifice everything to, you know, get that voice into the world. Um, yeah. Uh, it's... Um it's interesting to me, uh, like, I find even with artists who are quite established, I feel like there are cycles that they tend to go through. Um, like, and when I say established, um, in this case, I'm talking about um, artists who are, you know, touring internationally perhaps or even just nationally but you know who are kind of um making money making perhaps their living from art i feel like there are still cycles that people in that position which obviously for a lot of artists that's like a coveted position um but even those people go through cycles where the pressure of the industry the pressure of you know having to make something make some sort of music that you know is going to get a certain number of streams or a certain number of you know radio rotation ads or whatever it be um that they get to this point where that pressure is a little much and they have to kind of retreat into that vibe of art being therapy you know um because because I think that it's only through connecting with what that art inherently means to an artist that continuing to make the art is sustainable. Um, and, you know, like obviously in this world we live in, it's important to be able to make enough money and fulfill those basic needs. But I think that for those artists, they find that those two things aren't mutually exclusive like they can't kind of continue to make the thing that makes their bread and butter unless they shut out the noise a little bit you know um and without wanting to throw you under a bus but um uh are you um crazy enough to ha have a critique on triple j in australia <laughs> Um, I, th I don't have a critique on Triple J. I have more of a desire to see other platforms arise because um, I think that, you know, I, I obviously hear a lot of critique of Triple J um, and I think that whenever I hear that critique, what I really hear is people saying, I wish that there was a platform that would champion my art or it would champion the art that I like or, you know what I'm saying? Because I, I, it really, it has a monopoly and, you know, we see that. But um, I don't think it has to and I'm excited for people to come up with alternatives that can, you know, provide pathways for artists who are making, because, you know, any one radio station can't play every single type of music. So I think that, you know, it'll be good to see more support for other avenues. Good answer. <clears throat> uh, you should work for the UN. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god <laughs> um would you um what would you say to um other younger women um who have a desire 
to uh, work in the industry? Uh, so much. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I guess um, I would say find your kindred spirits. Find other people who you know, are into the same kind of music as you or are into the same kind of approach as you. Um, find people who are excited about your work and whose work you can also be excited about um, because it's through those relationships that you get the energy that you need to keep going because you need to go pretty hard, I would say. Um, but, you know, you want that to be enjoyable and sustainable mm. and people, how you do that. Mm. Yeah, that's that's good. Um, so just to wind up, I um, I know you've made a couple of COVID purchases, and um, <laughs> you you may you may not describe them as being glamorous, but I I really like the idea of them. So um, I think uh, you're sitting on one. Can you just just I'm sitting on. <laughs> well, I've literally been sitting at this desk every single day of the pandemic, like actually. Um, and I was saying before that I was getting Melodyne Elbow from tuning vocals every day. So, um, so I bought a comfier chair. It's like a gaming chair. Um, so that because previously I was just sitting on this like very hard wooden seat. It was like a plank <laughs> so um this has been good yeah in the armrest uh, in the armrest does it have room for like a liter of coke i'm gonna say no i mean i know that when i say gaming chair that might be implied but um no it's just a very straight flat armrest but it's nice to have armrests yeah. it's very luxurious <laughs> well at least the um the, the computer purchase you mentioned earlier to me isn't got anything to do with gaming it's just a straight out um you know rock solid um, yes desktop pc Yes, it's um, an Alienware Aurora R9, and I was just like, I got it because I was just like, I need something with just flawless CPU. Just give me all that CPU. <laughs> um, and so now I can stream Twitch and, you know, use Pro Tools at the same time, which, you know, anyone who's ever used Pro Tools on a laptop that you know, has none CPU will know the pain of. <laughs> no, that's right. You must be really, um, yeah, feeling uh, the benefit of that extra headroom. Um, it's a relief. It's a real relief. <laughs> watching the fluoro blue um, water cooling around the processor in your computer must also be really mesmerizing. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm just playing Some with fish you. in there. And <laughs> <laughs> Gaming computers are a sort of breed apart, but um, yeah, uh, no, it sounds like um, sounds like like as we all know, the, the the biggest and most important piece of gear in the studio is for the computer, and no one wants to talk about it. <laughs> I feel like you would maybe be disappointed by this computer based on everything you've described. There's, there isn't an inbuilt aquarium. It's quite sad. I'm, like uh, I should upgrade again. <laughs> <laughs> um, hey, uh, lovely to speak to you, Becky. Um, thank you very much for your time. Wish you all the best with the new album. Um, do you want to just uh, give uh, people sort of an idea of how they can get hold of it and listen to it and when it's available? Oh, thanks, Chris. Thanks for having me. It's been really lovely. And um, also, it becomes available for pre order tomorrow, okay. um, which is Bandcamp Friday. It's a very strategic move on the part of my label. Um, so I think uh, like from 5 p.m. onwards tomorrow, like you'll probably announce it in the morning, but okay. Bandcamp Friday starts 5 p.m. Um, so yeah, so it'll be available for pre order then and it comes out on September 25th. Right. And it's under your. Um Nom de plume, a fear. My nom de plume, yes, correct. Yeah. <laughs> Which is spelt like the word aphid, but yeah. with an R at the end because I didn't want to be named after a bug that eats your roses. <laughs> <laughs> and what's the name of the album? It's called Republic of Paradise. Fantastic. Great. Um, look forward to catching that. I've been enjoying um, listening to your uh, back catalogue. It's, um, yeah, it's, it's some ways scratching my Kate Bush itch. I'm not sure. Yeah, that um high compliment yeah, okay, <laughs> thank you know how well that would go down but um fantastic no i love them <laughs> <laughs> um, well uh see you later and hopefully we cross paths again soon
Absolutely. Thank you so much, Chris.